give it a few moments for those who are joining to log in and connect to the sound. Thank you for joining us so late on a Tuesday. Really happy to have everyone in the room for the first ever Africa Network for Walking and Cycling Forum. We've had a lot of really brilliant sessions today and it's been great to learn a lot about all the things that are happening on the continent in the multiple ways, shapes and forms. We have a particularly interesting session this afternoon with engineer Emmanuel. I'm excited to see what he has to say about the low speed zones and the global road safety initiatives and some of the activities that he's been up to in Nigeria. Emmanuel John, I'll hand over to you. I'll pop off my, my camera. Feel free to, to manage it. Actually about mainstreaming uh, the 30 kilometer speed limit as uh, default speed for urban centers in African cities. We have um, had series of campaigns in the past and this session therefore is to provide opportunity for us to discuss and dialogue on how to implement it in African cities. A number of cities across Africa has taken steps. I'm going to be leveraging on all of those examples to ensure that we can uh, uniformly experiment all of those across Africa. Um, the, our, uh, the person on, uh, helping us this afternoon to operate the system, uh, Jenin, other senior uh, representatives here present, uh, the UNEP. I want to count it a privilege doing this presentation on this topic. Uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the strategies for implementing Love 30 in cities of Africa. Now, just, just a brief about uh, our organization for general mobility. It's a non-for-profit arm of the umbrella body of general limited. We are a collection of 12 researchers and advocates, passionate young people willing to sacrifice everything it takes to ensure that Nigeria and in Africa implement sustainable transport and our people can move safely across our cities. So this is a bit of what started. Okay. We are all aware of the fact that road fatalities has become a global health problem the eight leading cause of death for number one killer of young people, age five to 29, and the third leading cause of death in Africa. It is predicted that if current trend continues, we will be having a very massive uh, fatalities in the coming years, except something drastic uh, happens. By the way, I need to define some keywords to help us. I've interacted with a number of, of uh, sustainable transport uh, uh, leaders and experts across Africa, and I, uh, these missed words that continue to come up, and I need to very quickly clarify. The word over speed is wrong English. Speeding is the word. So you're gonna be seeing me talk more of speeding than over speed which is the act of driving a motor vehicle at a higher speed than is safe or legal. Permit me to also quickly mention the fact that we have uh, the different types of speed, including the design speed, that is the engineering configuration of the road, which in essence should determine the speed of that uh, road. So we have the speed of the road, by design. Then we have the speed limit, which is the legal maximum speed limit set by the regulations in that city. We also have the operating speed, which is uh, the, the speed that drivers operate on. 
that is the regular speed known to uh, users of that particular portion of road. And then we have the safe speed, which is in, in our climb, we call it common sense speed, determined by the particular condition of the road. And all of these um, work together to determine the outcome of um, fatalities relating to speed. For instance, if a road is designed for certain speed and vehicles move at that speed, the tendencies are that there will be order on that road. But where such a road, the category of road that it is, or the function of the road does not go along with the design speed, then there is problem. And that brings about the need for safe speed, which is common sense speed in our own client. I hope that uh, this will make... Uh... Okay, I'd like to share a few uh, data about Africa, which uh, a number of us may be familiar with. Number one is the fact that Africa currently have the highest rate of fatalities per 100,000 population, 26.6, when countries like, uh, maybe regions like uh, Europe has only 9.3. And that's a big, big, big concern that we need to look at. But then it is worst when 40% of that number dies as pedestrians walking, and basically, where do people walk? In cities, of course. And then a whooping 657 billion being lost to road fatalities as 3% as of GDP. Um, I have also found this data that Africa has only 3% of the vehicles, but 20% of fatalities. And I was in one of the meetings we had recently, somebody was describing the fact that we are predicted to have 10% of vehicles by 2050. If that happens, probably all of us will die on the road. And I do not want that to happen. Also, I'd like to share a brief about Nigeria, some that's about Nigeria. Um, okay. Uh, about 5,000 fatalities happen in Nigeria, based on the Federal Road Safety Corps, the lead agency on road safety data. And the reason for that um, figure is the fact that their data is based on the actual fatalities they pick from the road, having been, I mean, being responsible for uh, rescue and uh, post crash management in Nigeria. So um, the data is somewhat low compared to the uh, World Health Organization figure of 39,000. Uh, we all know that uh, the WHO figure is based on established indices that is used to define. So the gap between the original or rather the, the, the actual that is published by the FRSC and that of the World Health Organization is a bit very wide compared to other clients. And that is, gives a cause for worry. And of course, data improvements are necessities that have continued to grow over time in Nigeria. Now, the cause of fatalities, the causative factors for fatalities in Nigeria, as you see, this is how we called it. We have poor weather, we have that, we have that, we have that. But if you go down to the end, you see speeding, speed violation, actual speed violation. Then you have dangerous driving, you have wrongful overtaking, tire bust, brake failure, and then root violation. Now, speed violation alone accounts for 47.9%. Now, the next five causative factors, one, two, three, four, five, are all speed related because you can't be dangerously driving uh, except you are speeding. Wrongful overtaking are usually associated with speeding. Tire bust can always be controlled if you are within reasonable speed. Brake failures can always be managed if you are within controlled speed. And to that extent, the next five items are all speed related. And all of those account for 35%. Which means if you can deal with speed, nearly 80% of the crisis on Nigerian roads are already taken care of. This was why the Federal Road Safety Corps went ahead to implement the uh, speed limiter, which is now 
um, an enforceable law in Nigeria, and it is mandatory for every commercial vehicle to carry a speed meter installed on, in its vehicle at 100 kilometers per hour. But then that does not apply to urban centers where the speed is less than 100 kilometers per hour, which means something else needs to be done. Now, Abuja, Nigeria has the highest rate of crashes in Nigeria. And you wonder, is the smallest city? It has the best network of roads, wide, sweet, neat, clean roads, and then have the highest rate of crashes in a small city. And so it's a concern because uh, it has come to uh, obvious fact that bad roads don't cause crashes in this part of the world. Instead, good roads does. And so in, in, in just three weeks ago, I had the privilege of leading other um, um, ad advocates to demand for implementation of Love 30 as uh, the, the default speed in urban centers in Nigeria. And that received approval of the National Council of Transport. Of course, such approvals usually goes back to the Federal Executive Council in Nigeria to, to approve. And that is pending currently before, before the council for final approval. If that happens, then 30 kilometers becomes the default speed in urban centers in Nigeria. And the reason for how much of that impact of speed is not far-fetched. Um, if at 20 miles per hour, which is about 32 kilometers per hour, you hit 10 people, the chances are that only one may die. But if that speed increases to um, 40 miles per hour, which is about 65, 67 uh, kilometers per hour, eight out of the of, of 10 may not survive it. And the reason is simply because your vision decreases with speed, your ability to react decreases with speed and a host of other um, uh, factors that creates that. So can we now look at why we should stop speed? A host of global um, decisions have been taken over time in recent years and which shows positive. The first um, decade of action in my opinion failed uh, because quite a number of things were not done right. And the second call gives an ample opportunity for us to do something different. And I think we can. All it takes is our commitment. All it takes is a, a vicious decision to get it done. And so we are looking forward to implementation of this. And I also love the recent proposal that has been done to increase the pillars of the decade of action from five to eight with speed, safe speed as a focus. And I'm looking forward to that getting approval. And so during the sixth Global Road Safety Week, Love 30 was the focus. And the determination is that cities across the world should reduce their speed to 30 kilometers per hour within cities. Does declaration or holding a week-long campaign get this done? Maybe my answer is no. But it's a good step in the right direction. And we must go beyond that, which is the reason for this course, this uh, program. We think that we can move away from just declaration, from just a week-long campaign to actual action. And like I said earlier, a number of cities have taken steps and we're going to be highlighting all of those. So the Stockholm Declaration was a positive one, but we need to go beyond the declaration. Excessive speed is at the core of road traffic injury problem globally, with one in three deaths on the roads in high-income countries at the death rate. That's huge. And we can see 40% 40 40 of fatalities in Africa are in urban areas. You can quantify what, what portion speed is contributing. Now, the Love 30 has been so much misinterpreted, even in my client that will, will get on shouting from here to there to force down the truth of everybody that it is beyond built up areas. It is beyond just school frontages, it's beyond um, market frontages, it's beyond that. Love 30 is urban centers, not school zones, not pedestrianized intersections. Love 30 is also, of course, about built-up areas, especially on highways and high-speed roads, of course. But then, 
the emphasis is urban because it is about giving the city back to the people. It is about returning the city back to the owners, the people, not the car. The city does not belong to the car. So it is about implementing the principles of universal access. Urban roads and transport systems should be safely and conveniently accessible by all residents, irrespective of their age, their ability, their gender, if they are children, if they are elders, if they are pregnant women. The city roads must belong to them. They must be able to access it. But where you choose to de I mean, design a road with higher speed, then there must be convenient, safer, more sweet option, and that is accessible by those you are pursuing from the high speed roads. To that extent, nobody will complain. We used to have, we currently have a, an intersection in the city of Abuja here where um, each time you go there, people keep jumping over the, the grill that was created. They build barriers, they break it. Now they build very tall concrete and people are climbing it. And I told the city authorities, you build the wall of Jericho there, people will still climb it. There's a pedestrian bridge that is about 300 meters away. But to use that bridge vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the actual intersection, you will increase your trip by one kilometer to go and climb a two-story building and then cross the road 440 kilometers. Who will do that? And for that reason, more barriers are created. And the more they create the barriers, the more people pull the barrier down and continue to dive through speeding traffic because such areas of the city are designed for cars instead of for people. A number of countries have implemented these, which are paving way for better results that we can see here. Uh, Tanzania, Toronto, um, Colombia, and London, different cities of London, uh, of, of, of Britain, of course, London, and then Bristol. We have uh, new policies coming up, the Netherlands, the um, um, Luxembourg, and a host of other uh, countries and cities across the world are taking steps, and we are delighted this is working in some places, and Nigeria and African cities must imbibe. A, a very clear uh, uh, example is this particular one from Norway. This is what went in. This was the result, and it's there for us to see. Now, what then do we need to do? How do we go about implementing this? I made three recommendations here, uh, um, drawing from different examples and uh, different uh, options that are available. Three ways of implementing this. Number one, we have a wholesome 30 kilometer city. That is the whole city is 30 kilometers per hour. Of course, suburban roads and crisscrossing highways could be of higher speed. But then, um, such roads must be completely segregated such that convenient options are provided and uh, low speed road users, including the vulnerable cyclists and pedestrians, can use such convenient alternative without complaining of why there is high speed. In fact, there shouldn't be access to high speed roads. And then you can prevent people from access when you have not provided the alternative. I've challenged a law in Nigeria that prevent that said we shouldn't ride by, I shouldn't ride bicycle to an expressway. And I said, from my house, there's no way you get from my house to my office without passing through an expressway. So all you need to do is give me a bicycle lane on that portion of expressway, and I won't have to cross that way. Otherwise, you are denying me, you are different, uh, the inference, uh, the chasing me from using the road and you can't determine for me what option of road I can use. So I am going to look forward to a time where lawyers will query whether it's not a fundamental right to say I shouldn't use this portion of road when you have not provided an alternative. Perhaps lawyers in our midst can uh, interrogate that. The second option is creation of speed zones. The city is classified into different speed zones, which may include car-free zones, 30 kilometer zones, 50 kilometer zones as is convenient. And each of these are clearly known, defined, and does not inhibit people's movement, neither creates unnecessary details for people who ride bicycle and walk, 
that way people will conveniently use the city. So that's the second option. Classify cities into speed zones. We have car-free zones, we have 30 kilometer zones, and then everyone knows this is what it is. It is documented, it is published, it is posted on the streets, and everybody knows the highway code speaks it. That way everybody knows this is what it is, and then that can help in defining the speed in urban centers. Number three is that road hierarchies are redefined. In essence, every road has a clear name and what category it belongs and what the speed is. Once that is done, and of course, this is not the same as speed zones because one particular road may cut across several zones with the same speed, depending on what function that road plays. And so um, road uh, hierarchy redefinition is not the same as speed zones. Speed zones are specific to locations, while road hierarchy is specific to specific corridors, specific corridors, which may cut across several zones. And so if this is defined, posted, published, um, every uh, driving school where people go to train knows that this is what it is and they are teaching every uh, driver uh, any potential um, driver license holder or those who are going for renewal and the highway code specifies it and the different laws gives powers to it and the speeds are posted and then there is requisite enforcement by the responsible agencies for road and road traffic enforcement, then we can have our speed. To do this, there are three basic um, demands for it, as far as I'm concerned, which I, uh, like I said, drawn from different initiatives and uh, published documents. Number one is the engineering aspect. Number two is the legislation. Number three is diversification of transport. Uh, so we'll look at it. Uh, specifically, the engineering aspect, drawing from the 12 targets of the global goals, um, target three of that document says, by 2030, all new roads achieve technical standards for all roads, road users, all road users, emphasis, all road users that take into account road safety or meet a three-star rating or better which means the provisions for ensuring that every road user is catered for is already there. So if we focus on implementing this, it will go a long way. And then the uh, target four says, by 2030, more than 75% of travel on existing roads, existing roads is on road that meet the technical standard as defined. Therefore, we can put our energies together to achieve this. And in doing this, there is the critical need for intercession treatments, because this is where one of the critical uh, issues are, intercession treatments, and then um, urban uh, speed, the, uh, I mean, building of roads that are too wide, and meant for speeding cars in urban areas. Many cities of Africa have that, including Nigeria. I was saying that um, Nigerian cities, particularly Abuja, was patterned after the New York uh, road system. And even in New York, uh, a number of changes are taking place in terms of converting high-speed urban roads to roads where uh, pedestrians and cyclists can use. So this is an example of what we must continue to do to ensure that. And then it is not enough to pour paints on the road. Let um, zebra crossings be placed on speed tables. That way you have removed the decision of slowing down from the driver, the discretion of slowing down, you have removed that from the driver and made it compulsory for him to slow down. And if you have all of those in those high speed areas, you will drop down speed until people's culture have changed, the driving culture has changed, and then you can remove them. Or use large speed bumps instead. And some designs here 
just little adjustment to the intersections to the roads can make a huge difference that will enhance uh, the entire thing. But then we must go towards crashing the car and focusing on public transport. If we don't do that, we'll continue to kill people. This means we must need to enhance our policies and legislation and some documents to look at, for instance. In some countries, existing policies and regulatory framework already partially provided for implementation of law 30. But a more definite regulations needs to be pronounced either as a law or as a regulation emanating from the law, not just policy pronouncements. What else? In the case of Nigeria, the FRSC Act already empowered the FRSC to regulate speed on all roads in Nigeria. But how implementable is this? I think it has been difficult to pursue because even though the law exists that says the FRSC can regulate and determine speed, design of road, um, uh, ownership of road is not that of the FRSC. And that places the agency at loggerhead with the state government, the owners of the road and all of those. So when, if there is a definite national law, that has a concurrent response from the state legislature, legislature, then it can be better. Other documents to look at includes uh, the enabling road design and road safety acts of countries and cities, road design manuals, the highway code, the national road traffic regulations like we have in Nigeria and the equivalent laws and legislations at the state level. If you put all of this together, we can have a clear but then, like I said, we must go towards diversifying traffic, moving, taking advantage of the ITDP, uh, UC Davis uh, published uh, three revolutions on urban mobility. We must move away from business as usual. Thank God for technology, but technology is not the future of transport. It is people. And that means the third revolution is what we should focus on, which says that even though we will apply technology to ensure that public transport is technology driven and bicycle can be technology driven, cycling and walking combined with public transport is the future of urban mobility, not technology. And like I said here, cars will remain cars, no matter the technology you employ, no matter the game you play around it, a car is a car. And to that extent, the complexity surrounding it will continue to be. And to that extent, we must make every effort. I state here that independent experts, NGOs, and civil society must take the lead by building coalitions to become a pressure group to government. And such coalitions must generate data, generate information that will compel government not to have a choice but to get this thing done. In conclusion, until our streets are returned back to the people, it will never be for the health of the people. Until our streets are returned back to the people, the climate will continue to suffer. Streets are meant for people, and we must continue to give that priority to them. Please note that love that is not just a hashtag, it is lives waiting to be saved because the world exists for people. So are cities and their mobility system. Uh, we need to build capacity of those who provide sustainable transport uh, development in cities, which is part of what this program is, is achieving right now. And we need to extend this to the actual people. We host this Africa Sustainable Power Mobility course we went online because of COVID-19 and we discovered that at the online sessions, city level officials are only 9%. Everyone we found, even though we had more attendance at the online sessions, much of the people who attend the program are the same experts that we are used to. They are federal level officials. There are independent researchers and all of those. The city level those who are directly involved in implementation of projects are not there. This is the reason why we are doing the physical courses. And then we need huge advocacy, loud advocacy that compels people 
and government authorities to do the right thing. Only then we can have a city where cyclists and pedestrians are safe to ride and enjoy themselves. Don't forget, it is our road, all of us, not cars. Thank you very much for having me. I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you, Jenin. Are you there? Hello. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I'd like to find out if anybody has any specific questions for Emmanuel. Thank you. Feel free to type them in the chat. All right, Emmanuel, can you see the questions in the chat? Would you like me to read? Or even uh, Gela or Jella, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. If you're comfortable coming off mute, you're welcome to ask the question or I can read it. Okay, I'll, I'll read it for you. And then if you would like to respond to Emmanuel's response to your question, you can take it from there. So uh, Emmanuel from Gela, she says, we are wit witnessing digitization of the transport sector. What are the advantages and disadvantages for road safety? Yes, thank you very much. Um, digitization has become a necessity as it is in transport. Uh, Hi, Emmanuel. Sorry, your speaker's acting up again. Can't hear you at the moment. Okay, can you hear me now? That's perfect. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I said I just returned from a, 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 a training program for heads of uh, mass transit agencies in Nigeria, where I presented the paper on technology. So technology has become a necessity. Uh, digitization, smart cities have become part of what we must continue to do. But in doing that, we must not forget the fact that technology in itself is an enhancer, not the solution. We must focus on developing NMT, developing public transport, and then let technology help us to achieve it, rather than using technology as the answer. And it has been said repeatedly, technology can also deceive because it gives a picture that you have the solution when you don't have it. Uh, so we must also be very careful to think solution. I mean, to think uh, technology as an enhancer rather than a solution. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, fantastic response there, Emmanuel. Um, I think you've answered that quite comprehensively and I tend to agree. You know, let's, let's address the problems as they present themselves and use technology as part of the solution, but not a solution in itself. Um, okay, I see a question. Renata, yes. How yes. do you think car culture can be disincentivized in African cities? Yes. The, the primary um, um, the primary assignment we have in our hand in disincentivizing the car is to know the fact that 80% of African urban dwellers does not have money. They do not have money to buy cars. They are poor. They don't have money to buy cars. Of the remaining 20 that could afford cars, only 13% of them have car. 13 out of 20 have car. What that meant is that we should stop developing policies that promote the car. Make the car expensive. And how do you do that? By promoting public transport combined with cycling and walking. Only then we can have a future that says car does not own our city. For instance, um, uh, during, after the COVID-19, there were a host of challenges, including transport issues. And the government of Nigeria was reducing taxes on importation of cars, used cars for that matter. And some of us were shouting on our voice everywhere that you cannot do that. When you are talking about addressing climate change, you are talking about reducing the number of cars in the city. We should do what cities like, I'm sorry, um, countries like Egypt has done where they have banned public um, importation of used vehicles, what South Africa is doing and a host of um, Morocco and other countries are doing so that we reduce the number of cars. So there must be a deliberate policy of government to target increase in public transport efficiency 
and availability, and then go further to make the car expensive. Let people pay heavily when they use car. Let us have well, um, um, emission charges. Let us have congestion charges. Let us pay for parking. Let us increase taxation for cars. But before you do that, you must make sure that public transport has become efficient. Otherwise, you create informality, which is exactly part of the problem we are facing. Because we have failed to develop public transport, transport informality has continued to increase. Thank you. Great, Man, just to build on that. Yeah, I just wanted to build on your comment related to the, the growth of used vehicles and the importation of, of dirty, polluting and often unsafe cars. If, I'm not sure if you've seen the most recent report released by the transport team at UNEP, but they predict that light, the number of light duty vehicles, second hand light duty vehicles will double by 2050 and about 90% of the growth will be in low and middle income countries. So predominantly in Africa, more vehicles coming in, more, yeah. more potential congestion and issues to, to deal with on that front. So for sure, a mixed approach is important. Um, you can see there's some more questions in the chat from Gela and from Brian. Yes. Would you like to address that one there in terms of effective yes. speed? There you go. Yes, I can, I can respond to Gela. Um, you said, in terms of effective speed management, what are key barriers in African continent that is common for countries? Number one is the political will. The car is a status symbol and it's difficult to tell the parliamentarian not to drive his car at his speed. When I started promoting 30 kilometer speed and I took it to National Council of Transport, one of the questions I was asked was, you mean we should be moving at 30 kilometer? A whole parliamentarian, a whole senator, a whole minister will be moving at 30. I said, and then, since we have been moving fast, has that reduced, made us efficient in attending meetings on time? No, the answer is no. Moving fast, does it increase the economic efficiency of the country? The answer is no. So political will is number one. Number two, like I mentioned earlier, is the status symbol of the car that must be dealt with, which comes from advocacy to change mindset towards what the car is. The car is meant for man, not man for the car. Until we come to that point, we are likely not to agree with the fact that um, we must drop speed. The third thing is the fact that I recall in 2010, um, we did a study, let me use Abuja, Abuja as an example. We did a study in Abuja. And in the course of the study, we, um, we demanded for change. I mean, implementation of speed bumps, calming measures at intersections in the city. The city authority heeded to us, implemented uh, speed calming measures, built bombs at intersections across the city. And within three months, we have 45% drop in, in crashes at those locations. And then the parliament passed a resolution demanding that the bombs should either be removed or modified because they were spoiling their cars. Why was it so? Because they were straddling through speed bombs. And of course, it was actually spoiling their cars because they have refused to slow down. And the city of authority didn't have a choice but to remove all of those bombs. And this is what we are saying. We need the political will. And that can only happen if um, civil society groups, individual experts, and the NGOs build strong coalitions that put demand and pressure on government to do the right thing. And then, of course, if you win one, two, three champions to provide leadership, then we can do it better. Also, what is the impact of poorly structured and regulated driving schools to the higher number of accidents and fatalities in Africa? That's also correct. Um, I didn't learn driving, I, or rather, I didn't learn driving through a driving school. I bought a car, somebody took me out, told me where the leg is, where the uh, pedal is, where the steering is, and I tried it. I hit my gate, first time my gate, second time, and I started driving. And that is how a thousand people learned driving. But currently, there are um, 
efforts to standardize driving schools, there are efforts here and there, but it's not sufficient. There is need for higher commitment to ensuring that the driving schools are providing the best kind of technical guidance to new drivers and ensuring that the driver's license have integrity. That will be clear that everyone who is driving is actually driving with sense. Ugandan government have tried some, another question, Ugandan government have tried to push for a ban on used cars leading to an uproar of the public. Yes, you do, uh, many times in Africa, we, we place policies on people. We, we just place it on people and people don't have a choice but to agree. This is what we should do. Let such policies come through dialogue, through people participation public participation, stakeholder engagement, public engagement, over time until people buy into it. But to just carry a policy and dump into people, they are human beings, they will protest. So a time has come to move away from placing policies on people, to dialoguing with people to know what they want, and to convince them that what you are doing is for their good before you go ahead to do it. So if you get an uproar, it is because you place it on them. They don't have ownership of it. Give them the ownership and they will do it willingly. We've had a series of such harsh situations and we've attended to it here in Nigeria. Okay. Um, there are so many questions. Can I take everything? Um, Jenin, I know Constant is already here for his paper. What do you think? It's up to you, really. You can run the session as you like. Okay. Okay, there's another question here. I'm going through so many questions. Maybe I just put one or two. This one said, true, most politicians, even at the level of junior ministers and heads of government department have lead cars, increasing the burden of the, okay, it's a comment. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for, my paper is over now. Uh, second paper will come in very shortly. And I do hope that something has been taught from here. We need to work together to ensure that law of 30 is implemented. Within those three options given, let us take advantage of it. And let everyone on this platform go back home to tell the government it is time to implement law of 30. Thank you so much. God bless you. We will now have um, Constant Cap, who is taking the second paper at this time. Constant cap. Are you here? Please, can we notice that you're already here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Permit me, I wanted to just introduce you briefly. Uh, Constant cap is a many sided expert, uh, a coach. Is <laughs> um, the senior product manager at Code for. Africa Census, Africa Citizen Science Program. He has a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Nairobi, Kenya, and an undergraduate education degree in geography and mathematics. And I know him to be a sustainable transport expert. Permit me to stop there while giving you the platform to now take on your paper. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, it's very difficult to give a presentation immediately after engineer Emmanuel John, who is very thorough and comprehensive <laughs> in, in his presentations. But I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, greetings, uh, everybody. Good, uh, good afternoon for those of you in West Africa. Good evening, those in East Africa and Southern Africa. And uh, good day to people in the rest other parts of the world. Some it could be uh, night, some it could be uh, morning. Uh, my name is Constant Cap. As I as mentioned earlier on, I'm the Senior Product Manager at Census Africa, which is a citizen science program run by Code for Africa. I'm an urban planner by profession, and I have been an urban enthusiast for many years now, um, advocating for better uh, civic uh, uh, cities, for safer cities, for cities uh, for, uh, that are people-oriented. I'm also a cyclist, and 
a regular uh, comment, commenter through my, my blog that I'll show you later on. And what I'll be talking about today is the role of NGOs and civil society groups in the adoption of the 30 kilometer per hour uh, rule as a default speed in urban areas uh, for Africa. Uh, just let me put full screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a bit about Code for Africa, who, which is uh, the organization I, um, I, I work with. Uh, we are fed, fed, uh, Civic fed, Federation of Indigenous uh, Civic Tech and Open Data Labs in 20 African countries. Uh, more, most importantly, you see the logo at the bottom right, uh, bottom left, which is Census Africa, which is our citizen science program where we develop uh, and uh, we, we develop and mount air quality environmental mon uh, monitors. So at the moment, we're working on air quality and we've uh, put some monitors in uh, Nairobi, Kisumu, Nakuru, that's in Kenya, in Dar es Salaam, in Cape Town, and in Lagos. And we're looking towards moving to other African countries, as well as moving towards developing other IoT-based solutions to enable sustainable uh, cities for all. And as said there, you know, I also have a blog that I run called africancityplanner.com. Some of you may have come across it in the past. Okay, so, you know, when we look at the characteristics of African cities, you know, we, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, Emmanuel, uh, Engineer Emmanuel, you know, mentioned how we have you know, 90% of the population can't even afford uh, vehicles, you know. On a different note, we can talk about, you know, having a large walking population, you know, more than 40%. Last weekend, I was in a city of Mombasa uh, at the Kenyan coast, where you, you have a model split of 52% of the citizens there, you know, walking as their primary mode of mobility. You know, we have not even counted those who use uh, public transport, you know, who access it uh, through uh, walking. We are also heavily dependent on paratransit, uh, you know, minibus taxis and motorcycle taxis that are quite dominant in sub-Saharan Africa. And this does have an influence, you know, uh, uh, on the, the way we move about our cities, because you know that, you know, the paratransit system tends to be target based. And that has a very big influence on the way they drive, because the more passengers they carry, the more trips they take, the more money they make. That, uh, easily leads to overspeeding, easily leads to dangerous driving, leading to the, some of the statistics that were, uh, were shared by Emmanuel earlier on from Nigeria, which are quite similar in many African countries, you know, where you know, dangerous driving and overspeeding ends up leading to deaths of, uh, of uh, many citizens. And, you know, unfortunately, the largest victims, like in uh, Kenya, the largest victims of uh, from crash data are pedestrians. You know, uh, in Kenya, 39% of the road crash victims over 39 to 45% of, of the road crash victims over the last uh, four years, three, three years, have been pedestrians. And that has been a uh, growing trend. The only, com I would say, competing uh, uh, sector are the motorcycle taxis, which, you know, we will probably have to have a different webinar on that on its own. We also have a lot of increased appreciation of non motorized transit. Uh, this is a positive thing. We are beginning to see a lot of it coming. I'll show you later on a slide from the city of Mombasa, uh, where you know they, they they are currently undertaking a special uh, school zone program. You know, um, it's something that was unthinkable a few years back. In as much as you know, maybe we are not where some of the more de developed countries are. We still we're beginning to see a bit of progress and a bit of appreciation on the importance of non-motorized transit. Uh, just talking a bit about Mombasa again, you know, they have you, they have what we call the red carpet program, where pedestrians are seen as VIPs, and therefore they've paved all their non-motorized uh, walkways in red in red slabs. A very unique feature for an uh, an, an Af a sub-Saharan uh, city. We also have a lot of influence from development partners. Now this comes in a very dangerous way. Okay, because sometimes you have development partners, you know, who will push for climate friendly infrastructure, who will push for uh, public transport, uh, uh, mass rapid transit uh, projects related to NMT. But we also have a lot of development partners who may be pushing for motorized 
uh, more motorized uh, based infrastructure. You know, we've seen uh, a lot of highways being constructed in our African cities by some of these development partners, either by grants or by loans. We've seen also, and, and, and some of, you know, we've seen a lot, uh, a lot of push in land use man you know developing plans and land use structures for african cities being done by development partners with other interests towards bringing in other kind of their own technology like light rail and uh, and and uh, metro rails eventually and you know so it's a bit of uh, the, the question of you know are we really independent and then you know we have obviously the growing emphasis of social justice in the mobility sector in nairobi we have what we call the socially just public transport working group that deals a lot advocating for uh, social justice for workers, social justice for passengers, as well as uh, social justice for pedestrians and cyclists. So there's a lot of potential, you know, there's a lot of potential as far as non motorized infrastructure development, as far as uh, environmental regeneration. You know, I'll, you know, I'll quickly go through these because they're quite related to the previous slide. You know, air quality, we, you know, in, we have air quality management programs similar to what I mentioned by groups like uh, Census Africa. We have civic action groups uh, fighting, you know, for change. And this, you know, relates directly to, you know, the topic, uh, uh, the topic at hand. You know, we have civic action groups in, for instance, in East Africa who really fought against land grabbing, you know, um, to a point where one of uh, our own ended up being, uh, getting a Nobel Prize after fighting against the grabbing of forests and, and parks. And the same, you know, we have a lot of community driven changes in public space. And, you know, that same orientation and that same direction can be taken up with regard to some of these, uh, you know, towards achieving this 30 kilometers uh, per hour speed limit. We need, champions, you know, we need individual champions as well as, you know, organizations who can champion that, uh, that, that, that drive. You know, we are beginning to see a lot more public participation, you know, uh, in, in Kenya, at least, you know, with, the, with our 2010 constitution, before any decision is made, there has to be some form of public participation. And it's very important, you know, that people attend public participation uh, meetings you know, be it for the environmental impact assessment, be it for a project uh, being uh, just shared information with the public, because through that, you know, both groups of NGOs, groups of uh, professional bodies can come out and take their stand as far as things um, like ensuring sustainable mobility and ensuring that we have certain speed limits being, uh, being maintained within our cities. You know, by taking part in uh, uh, public participation pro uh, be before any of these projects. And then, of course, we have the active use of citizen media. So how have we had changes, changes on, in uh, policy priorities? We've had a number of actions being taken. You know, we've seen advocacy groups coming up with non-motorized transit policies. We've seen groups like ITD, organizations like ITDP, uh, ITDP partnering with governments to come up with urban streets man, uh, manuals. We have seen, we have had civic rights groups come. Uh, the slides are stuck. Uh, Hi, Constant. Yeah, really, yeah. really genuinely enjoying the presentation. Maybe if you can just stop sharing and start again and we can see okay. where you are in the presentation. Okay, let me Thanks. try again. And you see it there, 10? Uh, Perfect, we're on impact of communities and advocacy groups. Yes. So as I was saying, oh, sorry. <laughs> Some of the things that, you know, communities and advocacy groups have uh, done together, you know, point number two, I mean, uh, you know, we've, well, point number one, we've seen uh, the Nairobi, in Nairobi, we had an NMT policy that was approved by the local government that was developed essentially by a partnership between the UN and uh, uh, Environment Share the Road uh, Network and the Kenya Alliance of Residents Associations, you know, and, you know, through, uh, you know, through that such work, you know, now in, in, uh, non-motorized transport has to be allocated 20% of the infrastructure budget of the city. 
same approach can be taken towards you know advocating for safer streets you know partnering with residents associations uh, you know we've seen uh, itdp developing an urban streets manual you know uh, which uh, together with the ministry of uh, transport uh, infrastructure, housing, and urban development. Sorry, it's a long name. You know, and that urban streets manual is critical. It's going to be critical in developing some of these safe, uh, uh, safe zones within our cities. In uh, Nairobi, in Kampala, and I think uh, also in uh, uh, Johannesburg, we've seen a lot of placemaking taking part, taking place. And if you look at the image there, that was from uh, the the first placemaking week in Nairobi, which was in 2016, you know, and there was a, a lot of discussion around, you know, slow, going, uh, driving slowly, necessity to have uh, better pedestrianized streets. You know, over time, this street has changed completely. Uh, I wish I could have shared with you a uh, current image because it's almost now 40% uh, pedestrianized. And the same, and, and the same has happened on, on, on other streets. And that also, you know, when you have increased pedestrian space, you end up automatically somehow you know with the drivers uh, driving driving slower okay we we have other other ways in which communities have helped we've seen communities helping with air quality data we had the public uh, or advocacy groups we've also had the public space audits that was done in nairobi we've seen cycling advocacy groups like uh, critical mass you know like spin kings uh, uh, who come bring cyclists to, uh, together and create that awareness and that record, uh, create that dignity and recognition for cycling in the city. Active residence groups, as I mentioned, you know, earlier on, the way the Kenya Alliance of Residence Associations helped develop a non-motorized uh, transport policy. Environmental programs, you know, environmental programs, you know, um, stop, to stop, you know, for instance, the cutting of trees in, in cities. And, and whenever we have road development, it's coming up now, the first thing that then is trees are cut, which, you know, needs to be pushed against. The, uh, the last point is quite interesting because um, it's something that happened recently in, in, in Kenya, which is peer learning forums. And here we had an interesting experience where the cities of Nairobi, Mombasa and Kisumu came together under the climate and development, organized by the Climate and Development Knowledge Network and had, you know, two forums where they were able to share their experiences with uh, as, as concerns um, non development of non motorized uh, trans transport infrastructure to share their what they are doing as far as school safety zones are concerned to share what they are doing as in, you know as far as uh, improving uh, uh, handling road safety and together also present were some of the road authorities and, and uh, the also the national uh, transport safety authority and that information you know influences policy and some people also uh, some of the uh, county staff, you know, uh, local government staff, you know, who attended uh, those forums ended up also being transformed. So through some of these forums, you can also transform, you know, the thinking in, in the public uh, public sector. Okay, and here I'll share with you an image that I took to, I actually uh, got it today from the uh, county minister uh, of Mombasa, the Mombasa county minister, of uh, transport and infrastructure. And this is a school safety zone program, okay? And, you know, he uh, likes quoting uh, Enrique Penalosa and talks highly about organizations, you know, like uh, ITDP who have helped Mombasa in developing some of these, which shows you how it's the importance of NGOs and civic action groups and citizen-led groups to work closely with government in, in winning over these uh, public sector officials to understand and appreciate because once you know you explain you, you once they they become champions you know it, it it's so easy you know to disseminate information to to citizens you know this is a project that is ongoing and you know on, on as far as creating school safety zones uh, within the city of Mombasa and you can see here this was actually over the weekend this weekend that just passed where you know, the first of uh, 84 different school uh, safety zones within the, the city of Mombasa are going to be uh, to be installed. And, you know, an even more interesting fact is that they are not using metal or wood for uh, these uh, road signs, but they're using recycled material. Okay, From an environmental perspective, of course, it's something that will excite all of us. But also there's the other fact that in Africa, we have a problem of people stealing metal for scrap metal. So when you put some 
recycle, uh, recyclable material, you end up solving two, problem, two problems in one. Of course, there are challenges, you know, and I think uh, some have been uh, mentioned already. We have seen prioritization of private vehicles. You can see that image there that I have got from the Kenya Highways Authority, an, an upcoming a road that's uh, coming up in Nairobi uh, called the Expressway, which is going to be a double-decker highway with very little, uh, you know, in fact, even uh, the, the artist impression here gives you the wrong idea because at the moment, we, we're not even sure if that NMT infrastructure is going to come as shown on the image there. Um, we have highways that cut right through some of our upcoming towns and cities. And then we also have a problem of multiple layers of authorities. You have uh, national governments, you have local governments, you have uh, politicians who, who want to interfere, uh, as was mentioned earlier on, you know, and and, and that, be, that, that, that is, of course, uh, a challenge. And then uh, the training of professionals, you know, what has come up also is that over the years we've had uh, engineers being trained to that, you know, the efficiency of a road is by the number of vehicles that pass through it, okay? Fortunately, this is changing. And, you know, we are important. We as the civic uh, NGOs and the civic action groups are important in ensuring, you know, um, I may, you know, maybe some of you have heard of an, an, one of the organization, uh, an organization I run with some friends called Nipolitans, where we bring together what we call urban enthusiasts. And one, one, one of the things we do is we try to get as many students to attend our forums and discussions as possible, so that we can ensure that the planners and engineers going out there already have a proper understanding of sustainable mobility. And we have managed to get many champions of NMT uh, through, through that over the last four or five years. Demand supply factors, you know, as was said earlier, earlier on, you know, there's a push for sell, uh, there's a big market for cars. There's also the fact that, you know, cars are seen as uh, highly prestigious. You know, I remember a few years ago during one of the place making weeks and a, a model of a street was shared, you know, on how the street would be pedestrianized. And one of the citizens said, no, but we thought that uh, with the country's vision 2030, all of us should own cars, you know, so that, you know, awareness you know and, and 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 you know the car the car industry is very strong you know and the oil industry is also very strong and uh, you know really profit profit driven and of course land use planning our land use planning needs to change we need to ensure that you know we ha we kill we kill urban sprawl we must kill urban sprawl because urban sprawl is forcing us you know to make our cities going go wide to make our cities go out there and when and that forces obviously more motorized vehicles higher speeds and it makes us it makes it very difficult for us to advocate for the 30 kilometers per hour rule and with that i will finish my presentations and open for any questions thank you thank you so very much um constant for that brilliant presentation covering different areas and uh, giving us a clear picture of why we must make a shift love that is possible in Nigeria, in Africa. Permit me therefore to open up now for questions and answers. Uh, a number of questions already on um, at the question at the um, comment session. I don't know if you can see them, otherwise I read them out for you. Yeah, I can see them. I can see here that uh, from Gela. Yeah, Gela says, uh, "What are the positive side effects of?" Mm -hmm. COVID-19 on mobility. Well, one of the things we've, we saw like in, uh, in Nairobi was, uh, you know, there, was a, there were rules that came up on the reduction of numbers in public transport uh, capacities and the fares ended up going, uh, going up slightly, leading to many, many, even more people, uh, especially among the poor in the society, walking as their primary means. But we also saw an increase in the number of people cycling out of interest, we saw an increase in number of people, cycling groups emerging, you know, from women groups, men, mixed groups, you know, people, cy weekend cycling actually came, uh, went, went, went up. We have, um, okay, another point here. I prefer to use the word public engagement than participation. Uh, I, I, te I tend to agree with you, you know, um, how can we get to increase active engagement? Well, you know, uh, during last week's peer learning uh, forum, one of the things we did was to invite 
Um, apart from only having engineers, we also invited what we call ward administrators. These are people who are appointed by uh, sub county administrators and ward administrators. These are people with executive uh, power appointed at ward level and sub county level. And they are the ones who actually run these public engagement uh, processes. But you realize that they're not necessarily technically uh, no, knowledgeable on matters of sustainable mobility. So at the end you know, of the session, I asked them, so what do you think about uh, all this uh, stuff of uh, sustainable mobility? And they told me, you know, there's so much that we didn't know that we know now. You know, it's amazing. In fact, what we need to do in Nairobi and in, in Kenya is now we need to train all our sub-county administrators and ward administrators on matters of sustainable mobility. So you, you realize that there's a lot of capacity building that must be done with people who actually engage with the citizens. Many times we do our capacity building with engineers, with planners, but we forget that, you know, there are also other people who engage directly with the citizens. And that can actually end up bringing more uh, po uh, possible, more uh, positive results from that. Uh, very innovative use of recycled materials. Yes, that, that was fantastic. Is there any other question in the chat? But, because I think- Yeah, there is hands up. Uh, yeah, hands Patrick. Up. Kemba, please, can you go ahead? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I find this subject very, very interesting. I have worked in this subject for, for a number of years. I started in 2001, when we organized the Pan-African Bicycle Conference in, uh, in, 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 in Jinja, in Uganda. And it started the lobby work for the NMT policies. And now the question is, maybe I'll, I'll be helped by the presenter. We have seen cities and countries developing NMT policies. In Uganda, of course, we influenced, we pushed together, we share the road. We actually are pushed to make sure that we have a national NMT policy. In South Africa, well, as there is a national NMT policy, there is also a city-based NMT policy. Like for example, we have, we have Cape Town NMT policy on its own. But my biggest question, which, uh, which um, we, we, can, we can discuss over, is having a policy and ensuring that the policy creates change. Because having a policy is something different. Because for example, in Uganda, we have a national NMT policy. And one of the objectives for uh, putting this NMT policy in place was to ensure that there is improve the safety of the, of the NMT users, improve the liability within the city, and also improve, improve the productivity. But the situation, the way it was in 2012, um, when we put the NMT policy in place, is the same situation, actually it is even worse. How do we induce investment? Because NMT policy is something different, but orienting public investment towards implementation of the policy is something totally, totally different. Maybe we can share, uh, you can share with us in case you have better experience on how we can be able to ensure that alongside the policies that are created by government, remember these are people that are car oriented. These are people that are persuaded by the, the, by the civil society to understand particular things. And these are the engineers that are being recruited uh, day and night, every day, that are already uh, car-oriented planners. And of course, as you carry out capacity building, of course, you cannot do it entirely. And with the politicians, who are the likely champions, every after five years, you have new lots of politicians comes, coming on board. Then you start a new to do the sensitizations and all that. It's a bit of a tiresome game, but maybe we can be able to share the best practices on how we can have a continued momentum of ensuring that we actually see the policy being implemented and investment being actually uh, uh, given to the implementation of that. I thank you so much. Otherwise, I find this very, very interesting because it is exactly what I, I have done for the last 20 years, more or less. I thank you. 
Thank you very oh, much. Yeah, you know what is interesting. Can we have a response from you before? Yeah, what is what is interesting is that uh, Nairobi has a policy, but Mombasa, uh, who are doing the red carpet, uh, the, the, the red carpet uh, program and the school safety program, do not have an NMT policy. So at the end of the day, you know, it goes whether we like it or not, it goes down to the people. There has to be that willingness mm. to be part of the people. You know? Because somebody asked, so Mombasa, raise your NMT policy. They said we don't have an NMT policy, but you know, they they are, they are actually doing uh, things. At the end of the day, you know, it, it's just uh, a Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can we have uh, Amanda? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, both presentations have been really, really interesting. Um, and thank you for them. I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled because um, I don't, think that buses are necessarily always the right intervention I, I i work in universal access i believe that all forms of transport should be universally accessible to everyone they should be integrated affordable sustainable you know all those kinds of things in a way that makes a transport system work for the people who are actually public transport users and pedestrians and that you you know the liberating thing is that when you can walk all the way and it costs you nothing to take your journey and it's a nice experience but what i'm a little bit puzzled because it's it's almost as if you know rail somehow it may not be the solution and i sort of think well why can't it be the solution um, you, you, you know, surely it, it should be, it doesn't have to be. And I don't think that the universal access, for example, comes with BRT. There are plenty of systems that are bus related that are not rapid transport. And one of the problems we have in South Africa is people see the BRT and they use it as an excuse to make the road eight lanes wide, where it was, you know, one in each direction before. And then you know, I'd come along and say, well, how, how are you going to make this accessible? If an elderly lady was going to cross the road, this is all she could do in a day because it would take her so long to get to the other side. And it's such a waste of money because by the time they've done that, they've spent all the money and they've got no money to make it safe. And I think that's a misspending of public funds. And yet it's so impossible to stop. Um, and sometimes I think, well, maybe it would be easy if it was rail. And so I was just wondering about that particular issue. Thanks. Yeah, very, uh, very interesting. Well, just to explain uh, on, on my point when I was talking about the, the possible light rail versus the BRT, it's a particular, well, what happened in Nairobi, we have gazetted some corridors for, for bus rapid transit in, in the Nairobi uh, the Nairobi Integrated Urban Development Plan. There also there's also provision for commuter rail, and uh, part of the commuter rail is on an old rail system. And what I, I've also, I've happened to use this commuter rail, and what what is interesting, uh, it has its advantages, including universal access, as you said, and it gets to a few dense uh, dense neighborhoods. Although the the challenge is that it initially it was uh, it's an old rail that was supposed used for carrying industrial goods, uh, but now it's being uh, used also for for urban urban rail, and but these they, they you know you, you you tend to have for, uh, a, a bit of kind of friction with different uh, development part, uh, uh, partners, and I don't want to to name them, you know pushing for different forms of infrastructure, which also confuses uh, confuses the authorities at times or the citizens. So you have one. A partner who will push, uh, be ready to give money for BRT. Another one wants to put, give money for a light rail system. Another one for monorail, you know, which kind of creates a, 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 a bit of confusion, and uh, you know, ends up you end up even with infrastructure not being properly integrated. Which is why I, I kind of insist, you know, we have to make ourselves independent to a point where we are making our own decisions based on our, our own needs, which I, I believe is. Uh, uh, in agreement with your your point and explanation. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Costa and Cap. I, I don't think there are other questions anymore, none in the message session, and then no hands is up. So thank you so much for a well-delivered paper.
Hello, Constant. Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Uh, it's also been very nice to, to meet, uh, to see some old friends in the, uh, attending the, the, the meeting. <laughs> That's okay. Now I'd like to throw a few questions open and uh, I would appreciate the responses from every one of us. Uh, let me first of all start with Gela. Gela, are you still there? Hello, Gela. Hello, dear Gela. Okay. Okay, maybe he has stepped, he has stepped out. Okay, I'd like to throw a few questions open. Um, we are from different cities of Africa, and um, I'd like to ask if there are specific efforts on the implementation of Love 30 in your city, particularly Constant, and then any other uh, person around who wants to give us an insight into what goes on in your, in your city. Uh, the third, sorry, let me apologize that the third speaker, unfortunately, He's caught up. He has just sent me where he is, stalked on the way, unable to make it to make his presentation. And it's too late for us now to ask for him to send the paper and then we present on his behalf. So we'll just discuss that paper through. Um, uh, the paper was supposed to give us a highlight of uh, activities going on across Africa on love tactics. So can we have ideas if there are specific efforts in your city or in your country with regards to implementation of love tactics? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Well, in, in Nairobi, I would not say that there are very uh, specific uh, actions being taken taken with that regard. Although, I mean, generally you have uh, traffic calming measures done around uh, maybe schools, hospitals, and such. Um, uh, there was an attempt by a member of parliament to to have it uh, legislated that in certain pl places you must have uh, 30 kilometers per, per hour. I've, uh, that went to parliament. We are still waiting to, to hear more, more about that, although it was some time, some time back. But specific measures we've not had. Uh, places like Mombasa, we've seen a much bigger effort as you saw in the, in the presentation. And, uh, and, and, and that you know, we hope can set the trend also for, uh, for other, other cities in, in in Kenya. Thank you. Somebody was, was, was speaking earlier. Please, can you just indicate? Uh, yes, Emmanuel, uh, this is uh, Brian from Uganda. Like you said, uh, I have seen a lot of, of, of uh, street transformation, in, uh, especially in Kampala. Uh, I was uh, with the KCCA, which is the city authority of Kampala. Uh, I was, uh, I, I went to him for some consultations and uh, I was really glad to find out that they have plans for, for more transformations. Uh, what we used to call Kampala Road, the, 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 the biggest street in the city has been transformed. Uh, restricting uh, movements and uh, reducing on speed. And uh, there are other streets, uh, like a street uh, we are calling Luwum Street. Uh, I'm, I'm talking this because of uh, those Ugandans who are there, who can uh, come and uh, who can go and check, like Mr. Kayemba who is there. Luwum Street has been transformed, uh, creating uh, cycling lanes and, and uh, uh, walking. Uh, you have uh, gone also downtown, if if you see downtown also, there have been transformation. So they, they, they have started. They have started the, the Love 30, the Love, the Love 30 concepts. I am really glad they have more plans. And even uh, the things have, uh, are being replicated in some other cities. In Gulu, uh, the northern city of Uganda, uh, they, have, they have also launched the, the restrictions of, 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 of speeds in certain areas, uh, especially uh, gazetting uh, school zones, uh, uh, restricting movements of, of certain uh, 
uh, types of automobiles to, to safeguard, to, to, to ensure the safety of children. So there, there has been a really great, great uh, transformation in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. Do we have anybody you want to indicate? Um, if there is anyone else who wants to tell us something about love that is going on in this country before we take the final uh, shot that will be on our way. Okay, um, okay Patrick. Yes, Emmanuel, uh, sorry. Um, uh, this is Patrick, and I'm very happy to uh, listen in and know the presentation. And thank you, uh, Constant. So I think uh, because Constant has presented about the role of civil society and NGOs, which has come out so well. And I, I love that the, the fact that you have really put some emphasis and uh, a lot of energy to the NGOs because, you know, um, I am um, sort of, I, we are, I'm from the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety, and I am in charge of capacity building, also monitoring. So empowering the NGOs is part of our work, actually the main work. And what I wanted to mention is that the lab that we have been having a full a sort of a long-term strategy on it in terms of advocacy, because as, as you know, NGOs will never implement the actual infrastructure or anything, but it's about policy. And um, we started this before the, the sixth uh, UN Road Safety Week, where we were looking at love that, and we were very happy that, that for the first time, the message for the UN Road Safety Week was very specific and focused on that speed, rather than just a general saying of safer streets, but that was a very uh, focused message. So uh, having picked up that, now the NGOs, what we are doing currently is um, sort of not only building their capacity to better advocate for that, but also a lot of research on the African cities about uh, that. And one thing that we have done preliminarily, and we are doing this also in depth, is to see that there are some places that have that kilometers posted, but there are no laws about it. You have just mentioned about Mombasa, for example, with the school zones, there's no NMT policy, but they are doing it. So uh, knowing that very well NGOs work from bottom up, from the community mobilization to heightened attention and then eventually policy, uh, so I would say that uh, from the Global Alliance of Angels for Safety, especially Africa chapter, uh, we are having sort of a, a growing uh, movement towards it, but it's still at the initial stages. We are doing the capacity development and research, and then uh, we are having NGOs. For example, I know in Uganda, there's an NGO, and Guru has been mentioned, Kampala, in Kenya, Nairobi, we are having actually a coalition of NGOs pushing for safer walking, and love that is one of them. So I would say, as what Emmanuel was asking, is about their, their efforts. And uh, I, I, I'm, I may speak, I'm speaking broadly because I know uh, the NGOs, wherever they are, whatever they are doing, we support them by capacity. And now that has become like a big movement that is tended to push Love that towards the head of state meeting in 2022, where there'll be a call for action on Love that such that it may achieve uh, sort of universal that or Africa, at least uh, by that time. So that's our strategy. And the NGOs are working on Love that uh, at their own capacity, at their own individual level, the small, how small they are, or how much how fast they can go, but we are supporting that. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick, for that insight. Um, here too in Nigeria, we formed a coalition, which I happen to be elected as a president only two weeks ago. Yes. And we are working on um, implementing all of those ideas from the global perspective as well. Let me, at this point, therefore, thank everyone for your participation. Uh, before we go, um, before we round up, uh, one of the initiatives of Ochenwa Mobility, which is the Africa Sustainable Urban Mobility Course, um, which is purely focused on building capacity of city level officials, even though most of our programs has been dominated by federal level officials, those who have the financial well without and, uh, to travel and do all of those. Uh, so because um, we started in 2019 in collaboration with the UN Habitat and TUMI, TUMI is a transformative urban mobility initiative of the German government 
and uh, we held the first physical course in 2019. We have a very clear vision, a very clear mission to focus on policymakers, city level engineers, planners, operators, young researchers and academics in the universities, advocates and development partners, uh, oh, sorry, experts across the value chain. And we are concerned um, with ensuring that we, we have the requisite capacity to deliver sustainable transport across African cities. So we host annual on-site courses in the city of Abuja. This is physical, like I mentioned earlier. We have also started an online course in, in 2020 as a result of COVID-19, which you are going to sustain. But the challenge you've had with that is that the city level officials are only 9% in participation. And to that extent, we are sustaining our drive towards the physical course to continue to mobilize participation of the city level officials. Then we also host customized courses for city level and government agencies that are interested, including private sector um, people. Um, the maiden edition was massively successful with participation of uh, six African countries. The participants came from six African countries. Um, and all of the um, speakers, or rather, majority of the speakers are funded by Dumi and the UN Habitat. So uh, there is no cost on participants except those ones they pay for their physical uh, logistics in the city of Abuja. Every other cost. Um, for certificate, for the presentations, for taking care of the lecturers, are all taken care of by UN Habitat and to me, and then with support of the National Open University of Nigeria, with which uh, we are partnering. Uh, so we had very massive, very successful government agencies at the highest level were involved. We have um, ministers, we had uh, 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 authorities, responsible authorities for road safety across, road safety and um, sustainable transport across Nigeria participating. Then we, like I said, we started the online in 2019 and the online was even more successful in terms of participation because it was more, um, um, uh, 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 I mean, we had more participants from different countries. In this particular edition in, in, uh, in um, November, of 2020, we had participation from 80 different countries, uh, very huge participation, including the Minister of Transport of Ethiopia and uh, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy on Road Safety, Jim Thought, were all present at the course. We also had um, a focused course on women in transport to mark the International Women's Day this year, earlier this year in the month of March. That was also hugely successful, including the Minister of Women Affairs of Nigeria was one of the speakers. Apart from that, each of the courses comes out with very rich participant developed outcome that we present to government authorities. And what are we discussing? Each of the sessions are focused on a particular aspect of transport. This year, we're focusing on cycling, walking, and public transport. The one we had in March focused on women in transport. The first one focused on uh, climate change issues. So each of the sessions are targeted at a topic, even though we cover every other aspect of sustainable transport, we have those specific topics that are highlighted. And we publish such items, uh, such outcomes. Uh, like I said earlier, the course is a collaboration between two me, UN Habitat, ITDP playing a role, Transportation Growth Initiative Nigeria, National Open University of Nigeria. And now we are having uh, the Center for Transport Research of the Kwame Nkrumah University, uh, Kumasi, Kenya, uh, sorry, Ghana, requesting to host a Ghana version of the physical course. We are, we are currently developing the content, I mean, developing the plan of action to get that done and we're looking at March next year for restart in Ghana. And any city for that matter could demand and if there are platforms for us to work together, we are willing to do that. And then we are preparing for 
the 2020 edition, which comes up on the 21st to 30th of November this year. And we have a very clear um, uh, direction to ensure that um, participants can come from across Africa. Uh, uh, we are glad this year we are having the Minister of Transport all the way from South Africa as one of our speaker, the uh, different uh, heads of government across um, uh, heads of transport in different agencies of Nigeria are going to be part of it. And we're having, again, Tumi supporting us, UN Habitat supporting us. We're having speakers from across Africa. I'd like to throw this open to every participant here and your cities to send participants to attend this course. It's taking place on the 21st to 28th of November, 2021 in Abuja. It's our physical course. And we look forward to your participation. In 2020, uh, uh, we, okay, 20, uh, 2019, we started the Open Street Initiative, just some additional activities that we do in Nigeria. This is a bit of it, and we look forward to your participation. Like I said, Ochenwe Mobility is a combination of eight solid um, young people, and you'll be glad to just hear us out here. And that is our team that we've been working with in the past three, year, three four years that we started all of this initiative. Once again, thank you for listening. Um, I don't know if Jenin is there. This is a bit of what we do. And we look forward to your participation. Of course, take advantage. In Nigeria currently, Twitter is not working. They've banned Twitter for over two months now, and they have refused to open it. And so we rely basically on the Facebook and, uh, of course, emails. You can go to our website and get details there. You can see there all of the things discussed here are all available there. You can get further information to be part of the course or at the least send us an email uh, and then we can give you a quick reply. Once again, thank you for listening to me and for being part of this session. I trust that little have been learned and we'll go back, returning back as people who will not only advocate for Love 30, but will provide leadership in ensuring that Love 30 becomes the identity of our cities in Africa. To that extent, cycling and walking will become the norm in our cities rather than the car it is today. We have developed the presentation I made. We have developed a toolkit. It was supposed to be ready before this meeting. Unfortunately, somehow we couldn't get it published. Uh, so it will be available on our website. That is this website here, www.mobility.oschenwell.com.ng. And it's free to just download and use, as well as all the other reports. They're all available there and they are free. So feel free to download all of those resources and use them to enhance transport and mobility in our cities. I want to thank everyone for listening and for being part of this great session. Uh, thank you very much. Can I have... Uh,